it's, it's one of those things where you get to look at yourself in the mirror and go, you are one of the best in the world at this now. There's this thing that literally tens of millions of people wanted to do in your country. People from out of the country watch, you know, the best in the world. Like I'm one of the fastest, one of the strongest, one of the most skilled at this position, you know, in this, this whole entire. And that is something to know that I came from such small statistics to accomplish was overwhelming. You know, like it's one of those things, it's, it's too big to even understand in the moment of it, I think. What's going on, everybody? I'm Chris Noggle, and welcome back to the show. My guest today is Anthony Trucks. If you've heard of him, you know he was an NFL player. He's been on America's Ninja Warrior, and he's the author of Identity Shift. But what you probably don't know is his upbringing, how he went through foster homes. He was beaten, tortured, put in the worst environment anyone could be to go on to accomplish massive things, to go on to help people change the way they think, change their identity and change their futures. I'm really excited. Join me for this episode. Anthony, I really appreciate your time coming on the show today, man. We, uh, we got a lot to talk about because your story is just one that absolutely motivated me and it will motivate our listeners and so many other people out there. But I always like to go back to the beginning. You know, it's like the man today was formed somehow over the course of their life. And yours, I like to say you were chiseled from, from a young age. So let's just talk about, I, I saw an interview and man, almost brought me to tears of when you were three years old and you're with your mother and someone's at the house and they're walking you away from your mother to the car. Mm-hmm. And you're looking back at your mom and you're looking at the car, you're looking back at your mom and, and you're wondering what's going on here. And then when you're in the car, you hear, you know, other, other children and it's your siblings. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, I can't even fathom that, man. I just can't. What happened there? And how did you react to that after you got in that car? Yeah, well, I mean, it's the first, oddly, like the first memory of my life. So it's, uh, it's, it's one that's seared in, you know, I think whenever you have like tough things happen, anybody's tough things happen, those things get locked in. So I remember all of it, the car, the lady. Uh, and it's interesting because in the moment, it's just a, a wave of fear because it's three years old, you can't place a logical mind the situation it's just a sheer you know emotional basal feeling but it is one of like you know falling off a cliff you know like you're just the the, the base of home which is your mom uh, is mom and then all of a sudden you're driving away with some strange person and then everybody's crying so there's that weird energy and the person's not like being nice i remember like a really stoic kind of face and i think when you've been in that position of the person of like the social worker for so long you probably get you know I would say numb to it in some aspect. And so I just remember that like really weird, uncomfortable, unsettling feeling being the very first one I can remember. But yeah, my mom was like, yeah, hey, can't take care of my kids. And she shipped us all off into foster care. And, and that was when you were three years old. So I have a two-year-old daughter. So, you know, that's just a year after this. And it, it just, Nuts. it's insane. So, and, and then foster care, you know, I read something that you put out about 50% of foster kids end up in jail. Oh, no, you know, no. 75%. 75%? No, 75% of prison inmates are, are former foster kids. I don't know how many totally get there, but of the amount of, if you have 100 inmates, 75 of them have spent time in foster care. Why do you think that is? Uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons, to be honest, but I think one of the sole, like, that I look at is in the foster care world, you have a bunch of kids who are shipped off to these environments where they're not really well taken care of. I was beaten, abused, and tortured in some. And so you have this mentality of, like, I'm, I'm really angry. And I want retribution. And it's just a natural, almost, I think, basal human instinct is like, when I've been wronged, I want to reciprocate. And what's, what's interesting is us foster kids, because our brains kick on so early, I think we deal with trauma. We learn how to be very charismatic and, and we're, we're trouble, man. Like we can, we can be slicey with the words and it's very interesting. And I think what happens, you have a duality. One is we think we're smart and we're, because we know everything. We've been through a lot, right? And then two, we don't care. We just don't care. And so we're going to do whatever we want. And so th- that little combination is bad because what happens is we end up going out into the world and getting retribution. We don't care and we're good with our words and we, we're sm- we think we're smarter than we are. And so I think a lot of people just end up getting caught and they just don't care. And the, the weird thing is uh, because of that situation, also you have you know, half the homeless population has also spent time in foster care because a lot of us age out. Uh, it's like a home. Oddly, I think there's, there's some comfort to the sense of like, I know where I'm going to bed tonight, you know? And so it's a weird aspect. It's not a good thing, uh, but I can definitely get the logic as to why a lot of us end up there. 
Yeah. And then that, that story of the chicken, you know, where you were hungry and they'd make you go chase the chicken. I mean, we, we've all seen movies where like they're poking fun of it, you know, ch- catching a chicken is incredibly hard. I mean, can I ask, did, did you ever, did you catch the chicken? I don't recall catching the chicken, man. I, I might've once or twice. I just remember like being in the chicken coop and like people laughing at me, like the little kid, I might've been four or five. And this is Pittsburgh, California oh, wow. behind the police department. Actually. I remember I remember where it was actually at. I don't know the exact house, but the area. And yeah, they just put you in this. It's kind of that thing of like the cackling faces like you'd see in a movie. Like that's how I've, I, I relay back to that moment. But I know where it was at. Like you'd go out the back patio. It was kind of concrete. had like a slab that went out. was kind of covered. But the chicken coop was in the dirt to the left. It was like, I say coop. It was like this chicken wire, you know. And they tossed me in. I'm running around in the dirt trying to catch this chicken. They're just laughing, you know. And then it was this thing where like, I didn't get to eat much. And, and if I, if they did feed me, it was always these Wiener schnitzel fries. We had Wiener schnitzel down the street. It was on like railroad Avenue. I know that now because I live in the same area, but I would, I remember when I'd eat them, I would take the littlest bites of the French fry, the smallest I could make. And then like eat it because I had to make it last. And, and if I, cause I never knew if I'm gonna get food again, I didn't know what was going on. It was wow. just a weird dynamic, but yeah, very, uh, very difficult environment. And how long were you in that, that awful environment, you know, the chicken coop and just, you know, where they tortured and, you know, just did all sorts of terrible things. Like that would have been from like three till how long did that last? Until six, man. But there was five, six houses. There were six different homes and they weren't all bad. There was a good three that were like horrible that I can remember, but the other three weren't so bad. And one of them is my home now, like one's still my family to this day. Right. So there are some good, obviously there's just not as many as I wish that there was, but it was a good chunk of time, man. And it turned into creating any of us that have these kind of things happen in life where you feel unsettled, there's no stability. Uh, it unsettles you. And then you, you have this energy inside, no matter what's going on in your life, even if it's not as bad as mine could be relative to somebody else, something lesser, but could feel worse than mine. Right. But it's an energy inside and that has to come out somehow. And I think it does come out in crime for foster kids, but it also came out in talking and being crazy, bad, bothering people. So I wasn't even allowed at kindergarten for like more than 30 minutes at this age because I was just, I was a tornado, man. And I get it. Like, I understand because when you have that inside, I just, I got to get it out. And it came out in all the wrong ways. Now, one thing that you talk about a lot is being self-aware, you know, as a child, you were Mm -hmm. self-aware. Can you describe what that means? Because I'm looking at this and I'm like, what is he referring to with being self-aware? Yeah. And how? And then I just want to parallel that to, you know, yeah. I go, I'm worried about 14 now. You finally land in a good home and then yeah. you set yourself a lofty goal somewhere after there. But where does the self-aware part translate into the next phase of your life? Well, I think self-awareness, it's interesting is uh, there's a statement I love and it says it's hard to see the label when you're inside the jar. And so a lot of us are running around in these jars doing our thing and the label outside says you're a poor communicator, you're bad with money, you have a bad temper, like these different things going on, but we don't see them. We just keep doing our thing and wonder why don't I have X, Y, and Z. And and I had no shortage of people telling me my problems, what was wrong with me as a kid, you know, and so I was well aware of them, I think. Now, being self-aware and acting on that awareness the right way are two different things. Right. You can be aware of what you're doing and still keep doing it. Like ask my wife, we get in arguments and she'll be doing something in the middle of the argument. I'm like, you know what you're doing? I don't know what you mean. Like, you know what you're doing? I don't know. And then later on, she'll be like, yeah, I knew what I was doing, but I wasn't going to admit it in the fight. And I'm like, whatever. So there's a dynamic there. But as a kid, I was aware I was rambunctious and crazy and, and you know, causing problems. I was probably the worst classmate you could have. I was always distracting the teacher and just messing the whole thing up, you know, but but I was aware of it. And I think that was one of the things that for me was an asset because in my awareness of self, I also was aware of the situations and the environment. And, and I don't believe it was because just of intelligence. I've been smart um, all my life. I almost was in gate as a kid, but I wasn't too bad to get into it. But what I do realize is because my brain kicked on, I was using it earlier. And on top of that, because of my previous situations, I was forced to look at environments for survival purposes or to avoid pain, right? So I was processing constantly who's around what's going on where am i seeing so the environment was not just an abstract environment like when i go places now i've never been in the military but people always assume that i have because i'm constantly scanning seeing watching and i I didn't even know it's something that people do but it's always been ingrained in me to be paying attention to everything so i'll be sitting places and i don't like to not see the entrance and i don't i want to know who's sitting where and i'm kind of presently aware but i think that's i can take it as far back to like second grade and being in the classroom and where my teacher's at. So if I, if I take this thing, is she going to see me take this thing? You know, like, so what's going on around me? And I think that was because of the foster care situation of like also being beaten and being tortured or being starved and just 
all these different nuances that start at such a young age. An interesting thing about that self-aware part is offline, before we kicked off the show today, we were talking about visualization and dreaming. Like during this whole time, you know, all these bad things are going on. When you had alone time, you know, those times where you're sitting there and you're just reflecting, uh, maybe some of the self-awareness comes out. Like, what were the things you dreamed of? What were the things that you were visioning, you know, yourself doing? Because if you didn't have something, you probably wanted things. What did that look like? Yeah. I think we all want things, man. There's that's the human condition. And I think that the wanting of things is what creates a lot of unrest for people. Cause it's not just the wanting, not having, it's the wanting, not having, and knowing you're the reason like that's the, that's just, once you get to that level, Ooh, it's a tricky one. But for me as a kid, man, I, I just wanted uh, a stable household. I wanted to be in a place where I knew that when I wake up, I'm going to go back to sleep here. Cause in foster care, people don't realize is there's no like alerting you that they're going to be taking you to a new house. You quite literally show up to your house one day. There's a plastic bag, a big garbage bag with your clothes in it. And they throw you in the back of a Crown Victoria and you're off to the next place. No idea if it's worse or better. And so there's that, that constant um, unsettling. And so I just wanted to know, like, this is home. And, and I never had that until I was like 14 years old. And so for me, that was the dream. It wasn't you know, being on TV, it wasn't being a sports player. It, was, it, was, it wasn't even like anything normal. It's just like, I want to have home. And it's crazy because like I get to go and do and see things now. And I'm like, this was not even in the realm of possibility when I was, wow. you know, six, seven, eight, nine years old. You watch, you know, kids going to baseball games with their, their dad. And like, that was just a movie to me. That wasn't real life, you know, but no, it happens. And so, yeah, that, that's an interesting, it wasn't until I got older, like 14, 15 was like, wait, I actually can dream. What's crazy about that, like in how you just explained it is you would look at things today and back then you would believe that's a fairy tale. That's not even possible. That that's not even, it'll never happen, but yeah. just that that's that limiting mindset that that probably comes from just that uh, in that unstable environment that you lived in. But mm -hmm. luckily you didn't stay in that environment. So at 14, you found a good home and then, you know, I, I love it. Your lofty goal you know, to make the varsity football team. Is this like one of the first times where you were like dead set focused on one particular goal? Yes and no, man. You know, <laughs> I, I heard you say like, to make the varsity football team. I had no intentions of that. I just didn't want to suck. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was it. I, was, I, had, you know, I did make the team, but I think people, it, it makes natural sense to be like, oh, he worked and he got to the varsity level and it must've been his dream. And like, no, it wasn't, man. My, my thing was for two years, I tried this thing that I, I had a passion for, but I sucked at. And we can all attest to having that happen in life. I'm sure when you first started this podcast, you weren't as good as you are now. Mm -hmm. Just the nature of the journey, right? But you had a dream of wanting to do that. And there's you know, a, a pathway to get there. And imagine if like your first couple of years of podcasting were trash. People are like, I hate your show. <laughs> like, I don't want to come on. You'd be like, oh, you know, that was my first couple of years of football. It was me going out and running around and doing my thing, but then physically getting hurt because I'm not as good as these guys that have been playing because I didn't play till I was 14. So I got kids who've been playing for five, six years already. They're way ahead of the curve. And then on top of that, there's the emotional aspect of like, well, I was good at recess at school, but now with this helmet and shoulder pads on, I can't catch a football. I can't see anything. Like I'm all wonky. I got shoes that are too big for my feet. Like literally did because we were poor. And then I, we had to buy shoes and I had to cut these little inserts out of toilet paper wrapped with scotch tape to put them in the front of my shoes so that would fit me somewhat and not be flapping around. But this is, this is my environment, you know? And, and so at one point I was like, I hate this. I'm done. 15 years old, freshman year of football, after the, after the season ended, I was trash. I was like, I'm done with this. And, and I had this moment where I did, like, I woke up and I was like, no, man, I, I want to be great at this game. And it was like this decision I made from some statement some girl said of, of her reasoning for being so bad, being foster care. And I was like, ah, that's not a really good excuse for the rest of my life being horrible because of this thing I had no control over. So it set me down this pathway. And my only goal was, how do I catch a football? or make sure I don't drop footballs. How do I get a little bit stronger because I was weak and I could like inhale and I could put my fingers in under my ribs. Like I was that skinny, you know? And then on top of that, I was like slow. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't very fast and I didn't have any skills there. So I was like, well, let's do that. And that's what I did. Every day I would lift weights. I would run routes. I would eat food, like whatever I could. I just, I would do it. And then I would catch a football on my back 500 times a day. So I, I got this intimate connection to the placement of the ball. I could throw it up, close my eyes. And on the way up, I could know the path it was going to go up and come down on and put my hands there and catch it. I mean, after seven months of that, you get dialed. And so I came back the next year and I had this way different internal chip on my shoulder. It was this mentality of, 
I have done too much work in the dark for you to take what's mine in the light. Like this, this football in the air, man, that's mine. I already paid for that catch for seven months. That tackle, it's mine. I already paid for that. You missing the tackle, that's, I get to get that touchdown. I already paid for that. You don't get to take, this is mine, right? And that mentality turned into performance, confidence, pride, that then it catapulted me up to that varsity level. But, but most people assume was like, that was the goal. The goal was genuinely like, what are the things I got to do to be better at the areas that I suck? And I got obsessed with it. And that obsession was the key. That's freaking awesome. And you know what? That made me think of something that I watch all the time. It's a, a thing by Earl Nightingale, The Strangest Secret in the World. And he talks about one particular thing early on, a study that was done by a doctor, the difference between success and failure. Hmm. You mentioned in that whole thing, you wanted to quit because you sucked. Yeah. You know, you just couldn't make it. You just didn't feel good. It just didn't, you know, nothing was clicking. You could have just quit. And you know what? Unfortunately, especially today, and this is something you help a lot of people with, a lot of people do quit because yeah. quitting is the easier way. But then there's, then there's success. You've had many, many levels of success, but it took a lot of failure to get to them. But in this study, he talks about 25-year-olds. Okay, So we're a little bit beyond where you're at at this point, but he talks about 125-year-olds asking them if they're going to be financially successful at the age of retirement. And they'll say, yes, of course. I, mean, hmm. I don't know, a 25-year-old, if I asked them, are you going to be successful at 60? You know, of course they are. But then if we really fast forward to the retirement age and we look at statistics by Social Security, only five out of those 125-year-olds will actually be financially successful. Mm -hmm. And then he, he talks about it. He said, and, and I'm getting to your football up in the air, right? That, that constant action and that visualization. Mm -hmm. You were creating the future you at that moment, but you didn't know it, but you were just doing it because you were trying not to fail anymore. Yeah. The difference between success and failure is exactly what you did there. It's creation. Mm -hmm. You created oh, yeah. something and it took a lot of time and energy, but then how many people out there, how many other foster kids, how many other kids period quit because of conforming? Somebody says they suck. Somebody says you shouldn't be doing this. Somebody says you'll never make it. And what do they do? Yep. They just quit and they never realize their dreams and never, you know, yeah. end up in the NFL. They never do what you've done today. That's yeah. sad. It how is do we, how do we break that, man? If it's that simple, if all it takes is yeah. creation, how do we instill into people that all you need to do to be successful at any level? I don't care if it's NFL, football, anything. Mm -hmm. It's just create. And that's what yeah. you did at that moment, man. It's that's what wild. I call uh, that's what I call dark work, man. Is this uh there's this thing that we're working on? We let a meet like a meeting today. Is this it's an idea I've been protecting because it's one that I think is a, a genuine game changer. I don't just say this because it's my idea. I, like we've spent some time on it and dug in. I like the more I look at the world through the filter of this, it, it, it uncovers what you just said and it puts all of it into a bucket that like makes sense. Cause I agree, there's this magical place in the future for all of us where everything's great. It's just there. It's gonna be it's gonna be great at that point. But then no one thinks about what do we do to get there. And yes, 100 percent you said something about its creation in my, in my keynotes. When I give, I tell people that journey I talked about, I was creating a faster body, stronger body, skilled body, but I was also creating a sense of self. So what you create creates you. And in this process of creation is an arduous, ugly one. It's like it, the way I look at it, it's like most times we try something, it's a 10 of 10 of pain. And a lot of us go not too much. I walk away. I stop, like you mentioned. And then some person goes, I'm gonna try it again. I learned this great juicy lesson. Let me go try and apply it. And then you would again, it's a nine of pain. People go, what are you doing? It's a nine. You suck at this. Why are you still doing it? You go, but I got a new lesson again. What do you mean? They do it again. It's an eight of pain. Why are you still doing this? But they keep doing it. And then more they do it eventually goes down to zero, but zero is not painless. Zero is joy. This thing I hated doing. Oh man, I can't get me on the field. Put me in the box, get me on the stage, even behind the microphone, bro. Let's go to work, right? And that's what we're seeking. But that stuff right there happens in the dark. And I, it's time that is work that's uncelebrated, unsexy, and heavily unsupported. People make fun of you. What are you doing? You suck at this. Nobody likes it, but you do it. It's unsexy, meaning it doesn't really look that good, right? It's, it's kind of this thing where it's like, it's this thing where people go like, it's just wonky and it's clunky, right? At the same time, like it's, it's something where it, it's not done in the light. No one's watching you do it. And I find that the reason most people quit, in my opinion, nowadays, because they want to do everything in the light. Look at me on social. Look at me in the video. Here's my thing, right? And then what happens is my fuel only comes from praise in the light. Somebody likes it, I keep doing it. If they don't, I stop. Well, guess what? You never develop the skill. The moment it hurts, you stop. You don't get to the very end of the road. 
But if you do it for the dark work reason, meaning I'm doing it for personal pride, creation of self, mastery of skill, it's unsupported, it's unsexy, it's uncelebrated, no one's clapping for me, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to do it. And because I still do it, it gets done. I developed a skill, I get to joy, and now I shine in the light. And those who are not willing to do dark work will never shine in the light. Dude, there's so much. Like, I'm having so many memories. Like you mentioned speaking, you know how difficult it is. Some people would rather die than speak on a stage in front of yeah. people. And, you know, we both keynote events in front of thousands of people. But the, the dark work, as you called it, getting to that point. I remember back in the early days of me saying, I want to be a speaker. I want to be the one on the stage. Because I was always in the, in the chairs watching mm -hmm. the speakers in their light. That dark work was just sitting up on, you know, a little podium, which was just a box, doing a speech in front of an open, empty room at mm -hmm. 11 o'clock at night, visualizing so deeply, like you were talking about the football. When you closed your eyes, you knew where it was. Yeah. I would envision a hundred people in the room. I, I, I remember even after I was doing, I was trying to master, like, how do I engage an audience? I was talking to people that weren't there. I was yeah. walking down into an empty room, talking yep. to somebody that did not exist. Yeah, I'm getting goosebumps, bro. Cause that's what Dude, it is. Well, here's hey, one if, more. If somebody walked into the room and looked at you, they'd be like, you're crazy. And if you they go, did. Oh, yeah, right. They did. And if people you, would if you walk in and I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't stop. And they'd probably say I was crazy. Good. Yeah. But look at you now. That's what I'm saying. Like that, dude, most people can't keep doing that. And that's the problem. But they want the success. Everybody wants it all, but they're not willing to do what's necessary to get it. I love that you call it the dark work. I, I had a moment last night. I, I moved into this neighborhood and in the middle of the neighborhood is a, the most beautiful, pristine lake I've ever seen in my life. And I remember it as a teenager, always saying, someday I'm going to swim in that lake, but it's private. And it's a rock quarry that filled up. And Ever since I moved into this development, I've wanted to swim across this lake. Now, first off, it's a lake, so you can only imagine it. That's a long ass swim. I'm yeah. a surfer, so I'm a good swimmer, but like I have do I've dove in and tried swimming across this many times and I get halfway, I get three quarters of the way and something in you just says, oh, you should probably turn back because you look back and you see the, the other side way yeah. over there. And mm -hmm. I haven't made it across. Well, last night after a long day of work, I, I got home and my wife was putting our two-year-old to bed. And I said, honey, I'm going to go for a run. And I went for a run. I ran to the lake. I sat there on that. And the sun was almost down. And I said, tonight's the night. I dove in. I got three quarters to where I've gotten before. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, I look back. Same thing. Because, you know, you develop that, that fear factor. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe I should turn around. I didn't. And I, I went all the way. And when I hopped myself out on that rock, you know that feeling, man. Yeah, man. You can't put into words. That's but the thing is that's. That's the one that, that created you. You're a different man now because of that moment that no one's stupid. One saw. It's just swimming across the lake. Dumb. It is. But, but it's to not, me, though. to me, it was monumental. That's the thing, though. It's it's the relative point to you. Cause there's a lot. I think the problem is we also we we cast our scale into the world to be judged and weighed. And the problem is the world can't do that properly because there's always something that's gonna say, ah, it's not good enough. And then it robs you of the pride you have to show up at the next level of your life. And so for us, we have to separate ourselves from the world's view of the scale, create our own scale and do things like that to where you stand up on that rock and go, look at badass son of a bee. Like, look at you, you know, like yeah. that, that is necessary. And it is relative to each person to a person who, you know, is not a great athlete. Like I played in the NFL for me, getting to work, going to walk at a mile, not a big deal, but to the person who hasn't worked out in a year, that's huge. Yeah, It should be right. So like if you let people go and diminish that, it's a problem, but but you have to realize that it's got to challenge you because here's also the thing. The moment of pride you had, you said at three quarters, I usually stop. You don't actually get the pride you have unless you've done the thing beyond a point of where you felt you could. Like it, it's got to, you have to truly invest beyond what you think you have to where it's truly of the level of pride to excel the way you want. You can't just go and put something in where you in your gut of guts, your mind knows you could have done more. You didn't kill yourself. You didn't die in the journey there. You know, like it's got to be past the point of logic to stretch to that next level. And the best part is when you stretch to that level, this stupid swim across this silly little lake, there will never be another day I dive into that lake that I don't make it across. Hell, I'll probably go across one way, go to the other side and come yeah. back and make a triangle. It's, it's just, you'll never, four. ever not go further once you reach that point. And that's just yeah. life. Roger Bannister's four minute mile, man. We thought it was impossible for a human to do it. And then all of a sudden people do it. And now you can do more. And yeah, man, that, that generally awesome. is the thing. It's, it's that whole concept of, you know, we're not afraid of our, uh, what was it? It's something like, I can't think it was, but you're, you're mostly afraid of the fact that you are of infinite power, right? There's, there's more to us. There's this thing that we're, 
we're not unboxing what's truly inside of us. And, and I think one of the greatest fears for me is going to the grave, having not accomplished what I'm supposed to accomplish and not push those limits, you know, and, and dude, like, I think once you understand you can, it's just trying to realize like, you're not going to die in the path of these things. You're going to live greater than you ever thought. You said a quote, and I'm just going to read it because it's so relative to this. I've come to realize those pivots have always been my shifts. Let's shift gears here. Let's go to the next chapter of your life. We're going to go past where you got a full ride to the University of Oregon. Your big break, the NFL. Mm -hmm. People, and I'm sure there's so many foster kids and so many kids out there that look at these professional athletes. I mean, I'm in Buffalo, New York, you know, and Mm -hmm. Buffalo Bills with, you know, Allen. He just, they just announced how much money he's making. And and people probably look at that saying that's impossible. I could never do that. If you say you can never do it, you can't. You did it. And (laughs) this is one of the, the coolest things that is to go into this next phase because you made it to the NFL Mm -hmm. and you did it. And, you know, you had a family while you made it. And I can't imagine that feeling, but I want to hear it from you. What was it like? You're that, that, that is a, one of the biggest life changing things that can happen to anybody. You, you made the big boys. Yeah, man. Talk about that feeling, man. Talk about what it was like for your family. And then we're going to go to the, the next part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's big. Cause you know, you now have this pedestal. The funny thing is NFL is it's the one professional sport that's wonky in a way of like, it's great to be there, but there's no guaranteed contracts. So, which means like, if you, you could be there all season, the day before the first game, they can cut you and you get no money from your contract, you know? So unless you have guaranteed money, which I'm sure Josh Allen does, but the idea is like that, that was, um, we'll take away the, the financial stuff and all that kind of, it's, it's one of those things where you get to look at yourself in the mirror and go, you are one of the best in the world at this now. There's this thing that literally tens of millions of people wanted to do in your country. People from out of the country watch, you know, the best in the world. Like I'm one of the fastest, one of the strongest, one of the most skilled at this position, you know, in this, this whole entire. And that is something to know that I came from such small statistics to accomplish was overwhelming. You know, like it's one of those things. It's, it's too big to even understand in the moment of it, I think. It, it was like, if I tried to take my brain, I'd be crying on the field, you know? Like it's not, it's not <laughs> that for everybody, dude. But the reality is, you know, in hindsight, it was, uh, it was one of the greatest things that my, that my heart needed to understand was possible. Because at the end of the day, there, there's no, I couldn't have plotted a path that would have got me there. I, I wouldn't have known what it looked like beforehand. But what it was, was every day that I showed up just saying, I'm going to give every bit of what I've got today. That's it. We had this quote at Oregon that used to say, uh, today, give everything you have, which you keep, you lose forever. It was simple, right? But it was this thought of like, when I go to bed and wake up, I got a new tank of energy. I got a new recovered body, but today, let me give everything I got. And that little bit more of giving everything I had, it gave me these deposits of, of energy of, of whatever it was. And I believe we're investment based humans, like investment bias for the most part, which means if I give an investment, I want to return. And my investments every day of that little bit extra than, than my teammate, you know, a little bit more, you know, push towards the line in those hundreds, you know, a little bit more, you know, weight on the bar when I'm lifting, a little bit more, you know, length of the run. There's these little things, a little bit more film being watched, those little things stacked up to deposits to where not only did I develop a skill set that took me to the highest level in the world, but it also developed this sense of belonging at that level. And that, that, those are two different things people don't comprehend have to be merged. There's a reason why people that win the lottery go broke in a couple of years, because they have this achievement, but they don't feel like it's who they are to have it. So somehow they self-sabotage, we call it, to bring them their bank account back down to a level where they feel comfortable. Above that, I don't. And so that's why it's hard for them to keep these, these, these money because it, it wasn't earned the right way. But for me, when I got the achievement and I feel like I belonged, I'll protect my investment. I'm going to protect what I've returned, right? And that's a big piece. So when I walk out in the field and I'm playing with this professional football helmet on, dude, it was the highlight. It was, it was a humongous climb in my career and also gave me a position within what we'll called my family where I felt confident enough to lead them. I have two boys, one going to college, actually going to Oregon in the fall. And, you know, I got another one that's coming up. It's, boy, I got to work on this guy. But the reality is, is as a father in my household, I feel very confident in leading my boys to be men because I in my life am a respected man not because of the childhood, not because of anything more than what I built with my two hands. And that's a priceless thing. And so for me, it's trying to push that into their world as well to get them to say like, it doesn't matter what dad did, how great I am. You can't live off of my success and accolades. You have to create your own. And I want to teach you how to support those. So like for me getting there, it was just giving me the ability to understand the life lessons necessary that I need to pass on to them. But now let's, let's go through the moment. 
the moment where some weird thing happens to your shoulder mm -hmm. yeah and it's over and i can relate and anthony before you do that like you know you, you may or may not know this but i was a pro snowboarder for a long time and you know, know it was the greatest moments of my life i mean much like that i got chills literally like, like goosebumps when you talked about walking out onto that field and that feeling well that yeah. was the feeling you know when I dropped in at a big event like X games and yeah. you hit that first jump and you stick it. And it was, I know the feeling, but I also know this next feeling I'm in mammoth California mm -hmm. with one of my brand new sponsors doing a big photo shoot. It's I'm from Buffalo. So it's gloomy, cold mm -hmm. and rainy here. I'm in yeah. California. It's sunny. I'm in a long sleeve button up shirt. I'm ready to roll. We pull up yeah. to the first jump. Everybody's there. I'm the East coast kid. And I'm just like, I'm going to hit it first. I look at it and, you know, I've hit jumps hundreds, if not thousands of times. Why would mm -hmm. this one ever be different? I drop in. I don't speed check. So I'm thinking, ah, it's got plenty of landing. I hit it. I go, I spin upside down and I'm going. And all of a sudden, midway through, I watch the landing go away, mm -hmm. which means now I'm, I'm literally just drifting into cyberspace. And I know that landing coming down is a mm -hmm. 20 foot fall to flat nothing. Yeah. And when I hit, I heard it. I felt it the crack that pop inside your head that yeah. you, you, nobody understands until a ligament goes. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I, I remember I fought the entire year to make it back and I couldn't. And mm. that was it. That was yeah. it. But yours is very similar. You had a, yeah. a thing and I want to talk deeply about this because this is a point where a lot of people get in their lives too. They reach a level. I don't want to call it the arrival syndrome. You reach a level in your life where you think you've mm -hmm. accomplished it all. And then one thing and it's gone. Yeah. All the stuff you built towards it, it goes crashing down into oblivion. It's a hard, it's a hard journey, man. And it's not. So for me, it was the NFL where I was playing with the Pittsburgh Steelers against the Philadelphia Eagles. It was August 8th, 2008. Uh, I was in like, I thought it might have been second quarter. I want to say something like that. And I'm the right side linebacker. They take a toss opposite of me to throw the ball running back. He's taken off outside. I'm running to go get him. I trip over a teammate, land on all fours face down. As I'm getting up, a guy about 350 pounds jumps and lands on my back, tears my left shoulder out. At the time, it was just, you know, something that ended up being a season ending and eventually a career ending injury. Because as a linebacker, you don't want to mess shoulders up, man. That's what you need. And so to this day, it, it's still crappy. I have to get a shoulder replacement in the next like 10 years or so. And so for me, it's like this dynamic of you come home and, and you don't know who you are without that thing no idea. Like I look in the mirror, I'm like, who are you? You don't play football anymore. Who is this guy? I don't recognize him to, to people in your world. You're not as good or important because you're not playing a professional team anymore. And it all kind of little by little dissipates away. And, and I aching it to this uh, metaphor of like a tree. And I, I, I came to find this like last year, I was writing my book. I just kind of threw it out and it ended up making sense, but it's kind of like the, the fruits of our labor are the sports, right? It's the, the competition, like you talked about. And, and when the fruit falls off the tree, man, it sucks because that fruit it can last a little bit. Like I'm okay for a little bit. I'm still close enough to it. You know, I'm still around my friends and after a while you get far away from it. And then like a piece of fruit, let's say an apple, the fruit withers and dies. And I felt that inside. I felt dead. I felt like I was nobody. I didn't have a reason for living in my head. It was very weird. And because of that, like everything around me started falling apart. My marriage fell apart. I got divorced. My business started doing poorly. I wasn't a good father. I got out of shape, like everything. And it took me three years to have a realization that, that I I wish people could get much earlier than three years, but here's what it was. I have never been the fruit. We have always been the tree, always a tree, man. So when I go back, I go, well, I was the guy as a tree that created football, right? That was able to produce in a way that made me a great football player. And the problem was that because I only looked at that one piece of fruit, I lost sight of the tree. So all the other fruit died, the marriage, the health, the family, it all fell apart because I was looking at one piece of fruit, not tending to the tree. But when you go back to the tree, you create better environment, better people, better soil. You give it nutrients, give it sun, like take care of the stinking tree. It produces sweeter and more abundant fruit. Like people look at my life and go, wouldn't you want to go back and play? And I go, yeah. But then at the same time, I can get cut any day of the week. It's like, it's like going back to foster care for me. I don't like that. I don't want to not know if I have a job tomorrow. My body's at risk. I'm away from the family for seven to 10 months of the year. And on top of that, you're subjected to this crazy pressure that really is, unless you're getting paid really, really well, it's not fun. It's not like you think when you're playing Pop Warner football, it's a business. And so for me, man, I now have, I make as much as I did when I played, if not more, actually, 
I have a lot more freedom, a lot more time. My body's safe. I can do what I want. Like, this is a vastly sweeter life than I ever would have had playing professional football for the next 10 years, you know? And so for me, it was all because I finally went back and took care of the tree. You created that journey, that path to become that person you wanted to be, that NFL player. But really, at the end of the day, when you talk about like creation, you weren't in full control of that environment. No. You just mentioned it, like at any second, any injury, anytime something doesn't work right, they can cut you. But mm -hmm. what you've created today, the creation that you've done now, you're in full control of. Full so control. the only person that can take that away is you. But you've already come through enough to realize that the only way to fail is to quit. And you're not going to quit. Once no, somebody stop. reaches that level, nobody quits. That's the beauty. But yeah. they failed the whole way. Yeah, it did. You know, I think it's at a certain point, too, you start to have, I, I have this weird um, enjoyment with difficulty. You know, it's, uh, it's hard to explain. I, I don't, not to say I welcome and enjoy problems, not the case, but I love puzzles, man. I have this, this desire to unpack and deal with and figure out solutions to puzzles. And life for me is just a humongous puzzle. You know, when something comes in a pipeline, my, it's, it's one thing to say, um, I'm not a quitter. It's a whole other thing for me to say, I don't even comprehend quitting. It doesn't, it's not something that comes into my brain as a possibility or a thought process because it's just a puzzle. And if I, if I enjoy the puzzle, it's inevitable that I'll keep doing this and not stop. But if I am completely like deathly afraid of, or I hate the puzzle, figuring it out, then I'll always run from it. I will quit consistently because it's always going to be harder than you know how to handle. But like every day I do like three different things between word searches and puzzles that are like based on, you know, weird, like, you know, crossword stuff. I just I love figuring it out. But for me, it's the same thing when something happens in business or with my family or with, you know, whatever it might be. It's happened all my life. And so at this point, I have a, a palpable connection in a positive way to things going oddly wrong in my life because I go, ooh, new puzzle, let's figure it out. So because of that, there isn't this mentality of quitting. Wow. I love that analogy. That's freaking awesome. I never really thought of it as a puzzle. Never at all. And every one of those puzzles is a new challenge. I want to, you know, I'm going to get ahead of myself. So I got to bring myself back a second, but you wrote a book, Identity Shift. Yeah. Writing books is tough. I've done three. It's yeah. a pain in the butt. Like, why did you mm -hmm. write a book? Like, what was your motivation? Because most people start a book, but they never finish it. Yeah. You did. What, was, yeah. what was the motivation there? I think one of it was, uh, well, it wasn't even my idea to write the book and publish it, to be quite honest. I, had, I was cooking up ideas in the background, and I, I, I always segment my thoughts because I don't like to hold things in my brain because then I lose it. So I have a really unique way of how I just dump things out of my head. And I was dumping thoughts. One was like, what is, what is the concept or what are the concepts I want uh, to be understood about my perspective of identity shift? then what are like interesting stories in my life that connect to that? Because if I go on a podcast, I want to be able to talk to it, right? And then I was like, where does data support this? Where is this more than just Anthony's weird thought? Where is this something that someone can go, no, look, here's some studies done that show this. And I put it all in three separate docs. And I was talking to a guy, I kind of told him about this. He goes, I got a publisher you should talk to. So I talked to the publisher. She goes, you have vastly more done as an author for a book than like 95% of people I ever come across. He's like, this needs to just, just, just write it. <laughs> He's like, it's just there. Just write these things. Out. I was like, all right. And so for me, it was this thing where it's like, okay, cool. And then my brain works in a way that allows me to take big ideas and chunk them down. They say, what's the fastest way to eat an elephant one bite at a time. Right. I love that. So I, don't, I never look at the elephant. I go, okay, cool. I mean, my brain goes like this. If I was to break this book up into sections, the chunks, let's just type hours. Right. How, how many words I want to put into a chapter? It was like 5,000. I said, okay, cool. How long does it take me to write 5,000 words? So I wrote 5,000 words. It's like, oh, about three hours. Okay, cool. So I just need to go ahead and set aside 10 different days to write for three hours over however span of time we have. And then I just would sit down on that day. It was like usually once, maybe twice a week and just get my tea ready, prepared, do some movement. I was excited to sit down, sat down, float in. And it got written. And for me, I don't like open loops. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to get this done. And I'm really good at staying disciplined. So if it said three hours that day, that's just what I did. It's like a football practice for me. If coach says you got practice at three o'clock, you don't choose to go to practice. You're going to practice, man. Like that's what it is. And so that, that way that I operated in my life, it just carried over. And so I sat down, wrote it and got it done. But the big thing after all that was I wanted people to have a working understanding of this thing that is controlling their life that they're completely out of control of. 
if you think about how our computer works, this is actually the thing I talk about in the book, we're right now operating off the hardware and the software, right? The program of Zoom, the hardware of cameras, but there's something in between that makes it all work, which is the operating system. It's invisible, but it's letting everything take place. Without the right operating system, you can't put the program on or the hardware to it. That for us as humans is our identity. The programs are the marriage, the, you know, the health, the wellness, the business, right? The, the hardware is our body, but that in-between piece is the identity that's really managing all these things. And it's invisible. And for me, I wanted to give people this understanding of like the, the reason certain people have success is not because of the information and the, the software that they have, right? It's not because they have bigger muscles. It's solely because of how their identity operates in the world how they view things instinctually uh, without processing because your identity is who you are when you're not thinking about who you are. It's just how you flow. And so when you see some people have the Midas touch, there's, there's nothing special about them, but they've learned to upgrade their identity to where when you see something that overwhelms you, shuts you down, you see it as negative, they just don't. They can't even get themselves into the headspace that you have because it's just not how they process. Their identity doesn't operate that way. Therefore, they touch something, figure it out, they get it done and move on. You think it's magic. It's just who they are. And so I, I noticed that was part of who I developed myself to be. That was not something most people had. And so the book was a way to uncover that concept and then teach people how to actually do this proactively because we all have an identity. We just didn't usually create it with intention. Teachers, preachers, coaches, leaders, school did it, right? But nobody stepped in and said, do I really want to process that way? Don't want to shut down what's happened. Do, is this a belief I want to carry, you know? And they live their life from that. And so it's a time to step back and go, let me just throw all this away, maybe reprogram what I want it to be, show up as a higher level human. There's one other part that makes up that identity shift for you that we skipped over, but we're going to come back to it. And it's the part after everything did fall apart. I think mm -hmm. most of our listeners, you know, and most of the people we speak to have had that moment where, they felt like they've reached a certain level and then all of a sudden something happens and it's like a snowball, you know, when I call it the domino yeah, effect, the spiral effect. And so you have this injury, your NFL yeah. career is gone, money's drying up, you go and you start training to support your family, you start yeah. a gym and you're just about bankrupt and you go for a drive in your car. Now, before I do that, let me just parallel and transition over just to a personal story here. I had one of those moments in my truck where I was driving on a dark road and just to sum it up, I was waiting for a phone call and that phone call was going to come from my producer telling me, and in my mind, this was already just determined that me and my wife got the TV show that we've been working for four years on with HGTV. Mm -hmm. Everything up to that point was like a fairy tale. We were flipping houses. We had the sizzle reel. It went through green light. Second show out of green light. Everything was checking off. We're churning along. All now I needed is that one phone call, that final decision. Mm -hmm. Dark road driving, the phone rings. There it is. It's the producer. Eagerly optimistic. I grabbed the phone. I'm like, hey, what's going on? The other person on the other end of the voice wasn't as excited. And it was, it's going okay. And I'm like, oh no. Mm -hmm. Well, we got the word from HGTV and they're not going to move forward. They're they just switched and got bought by Discovery and they're, they're not moving forward with any new shows. I'm really sorry, but mm. it's not going to work this time. Set the phone down. I'm going 60 miles an hour down on a dark road. Everything we'd worked for for four years came to a screeching halt. I had burned the boats. I had left my Wall Street firm that I mm. worked for, left a, a couple hundred thousand dollar easy money job because I was chasing this dream. And now all of a sudden, right there, that dream just got shattered. And much like your one moment where you were driving, the thing that crossed my mind first was, how am I going to tell my wife this? Because I was the first call. Mm -hmm. How am I going to drive home and tell my wife this? And I thought maybe it'd be easier if I just jerk the wheel to the right and I mm -hmm. drive into that tree right there. And then I don't have to explain anything to anybody. That's my story. Clearly, I didn't drive into the thing. There was yeah. one person they called me when I got home after I told my wife and I'm not going to talk about my story. If anyone mm. wants that, they can watch other episodes. I want to hear your story. Yeah, man. You had a moment like that where you're in the car, your life had yeah. just fallen apart. You're at the lowest point or so you thought, and there, there comes that decision where you really start thinking, maybe I'm just going to end it. Yeah. It's a tough one, man. Cause we, all have, we have our thresholds where we're able to accomplish and handle. I think we got, we all have our abilities to, uh, yeah, literally to handle certain things. And if you are not capable of handling that thing, 
it all comes tumbling down. For me, it was this thing where it didn't happen in a singular moment. It had been building up and I hadn't let the pressure get to me. Like I hadn't allowed things to actually settle into my soul. So I'd gone through some things in the marriage. I got through some things with the family. The business wasn't doing very well. Uh, everything, everything just sucked, you know? And so now I'm looking at, you know, not having my family, not having my business. And it was this moment where I'm like, I'd been foggy. I call it a fog, right? The fog is when you're getting up, going through the motions, but you're almost like, not clearly present, you know, you literally just waiting for the day to get over. And I remember I would just go to the gym where I owned my, my gym business and I'd be training people and I'd have to give them my happy, but I had no happy. So I was extracting it from literally nowhere. So when I would get in my car, I would sit in my car for like an hour afterwards and just sit there because I didn't have the energy to start the car and drive home. It was just, that was done. And then I, I remember I'd gone on this Saturday after a fight with my wife, it was like one of the final fights. I'd gone to uh, this thing with my buddies like a, a ufc fight and i got there like you know seven or eight o'clock at night and those fights usually to like 10 o'clock you know they're on for a few hours i remember sitting there and getting up and leaving and, and i i didn't realize it until i left my best friend walks out he goes hey Aunt, man i go what he goes Dude, you, you didn't move for like three hours you didn't talk to anybody i must have just i sat still in the chair and like didn't acknowledge anybody and he goes hey i, I know kind of what's going on he didn't know everything but he goes this simply says dude this is your reality that was it literally like four simple words and it was kind of this thing where like he, he had realized I was not accepting the reality of what was going on in my life. And so I remember getting in the car and then like it just hit, like it just slams on you. And when those moments hit, like your brain can't actually decipher between physical and emotional pain at times. And so like I couldn't stop crying. My face just was, you know, like pouring out tears. I was snotty. And I remember like it was just a pain that I couldn't get to stop. I could feel it in my body. And so I sent a text and I said, please tell my friends and family, or like, please tell my kids who my who their father was. And I just, I drove oh. off. I was looking for, it was like 10 o'clock ish at night. I'm looking for a stored rat poison. And I, I took the, the wrong route in a sense of for that. Cause the route I took was like the back roads to get out of town. It was like the closest, getting the free, just start driving. I just started driving. I find myself like maybe an hour later in this town called Stockton, sit next to a gas station. Cause it was the only place, I like, guess it was the only place that was there, but they didn't have what I wanted. And so I just sat there, man. And I, I think in the moment, the wave kind of subsided because the police ended up finding me through GPS and the phone and they come up to the car and, you know, guns are drawn because they think I got a weapon or something. And um, I kind of like, no, I'm fine. I get in. I, I'm, I'm good at speaking. So in a sense, they're like, what's going on? I was like, I'm fine. Like well, your wife said something happened. I said, no, I'm, I'm good. Just hanging out. I don't know what's going on. You know, we're, we're kind of going. Our, I just kind of played it off. Like, well, go home because, man, you got a lot of people that are looking for you. So like it kind of, you know, it was like a long drive home. I remember pulling up and this is where like, like the moment that I think my, my manhood finally turned into who I am now, it was, it was like the genuine rock bottom, you know, cause that's a rock bottom to send to a couple of friends and family. But I pull up to my house and outside of my house, it's about 30 people all looking for me. People from my gym, my family, friends, their friends, you know, people that knew me through people that knew me, like, and I pulled up in my car and they're all like, this is crazy. We've been looking for you. Here you are. I remember getting out. My dad walks up. And like, I didn't even say words to him. And I just kind of was just sitting there and like, he gave me a hug. And then um, in me getting there, the, the ambulance had came up. Cause you know what, most situations happen. They call an ambulance 5150. They have to wrap you up and throw you in the paddy wagon, you know? And, uh, and they saw I was calm and I was they're like, do you want to go? And I was like, I don't need to, but I can't face these people right now. So please take me. And so on my own accord, I like got in just to avoid everybody uh, and having to talk to them and got in and took off, man. And, and that, that was the moment where, like I, I finally was in the next stage, next couple of days, having conversations with people about the depths of my despair. And that was kind of the catalyst to me opening up. Cause prior to that, I'm a former NFL guy, football player, Anthony trucks. Like I don't, I don't have any chinks in my armor. Look at me, you know, and then you don't let anybody in the real part of you. And so you feel lonely and you feel silent and you feel the pain. And the only way in your mind to end it at times is just to end it. Hell of a story, man. It's insane. What point, because in the book, you write about this a lot, you know, the divorce. At mm -hmm. what point was that? Was that right after that moment? Or um, had that already happened? It was, it was, I think the thing was, if that hadn't happened, I think it would have came faster. I think that was something where she felt more guilty for, you know, wanting things apart and go separate ways. So it kind of, it hung on and latched on way longer than it needed to be. I think it was probably good maybe another year after that, where we finally like really parted ways and like went our separate ways. But um, it should have happened earlier, man. We, we should have parted ways earlier. And the interesting thing is, you know, we were 16 years old. When we got together. I've never, like, 
been in a relationship before her, you know, I've, uh, I'd, I'd never loved anybody else. And so like, it was somewhere we were trying to figure out who the heck we were. We'd gone through college with a kid, NFL post career, me being broke. It just was nuts. And we had no clue who we were without each other. And I think there was a dynamic there of curiosity for other partners and different stuff. And so as much as I, I don't like how it unfolded or it was hard, I'd go through it 10 times over to have what we have now. Cause we, after three years divorced and finally figured ourselves out mm-hmm. with no intention of coming back together, we are now remarried. Is That's everything awesome. perfect? Like, no, man, we just had a little bickering match back and forth about how to parent our youngest son five minutes before I got on this whole episode, right? We're human, but there is a base of like connectedness that is unbreakable in that space now. And so while it did fall apart, it needed to, so it can come back together how it is. Love that, man. Making up that whole identity shift. So I came up with this idea I was trying to think like, how do I wrap this? Like, how do you bring this all together? And I'm curious too. Let me know. <laughs> I thought about the identity shift. So there's a lot of people out there that just listen to almost your entire life story from three right up to, I mean, well, they can just research where you're at now. I mean, that, that's easy to see, but right up to this moment, yeah. but there was a lot that went into this identity shift. So a lot of people are thinking, where do I start? So mm. I just said, what is step number one? So if that's somebody wants to have an identity shift, what's step number one? Yeah, well, I did think through this. Uh, the football player in me and the curious human being that does define things and get, get the science behind it, I created a process called the shift method. It's a methodology you can go through to actually make a shift in your identity. And the whole purpose of it is to go through, kind of like I did before when I was 15 and have done many times after, of, of you achieve but transform simultaneously. And it's not magic. It's just if you do it right, you've already done it. And it's just doing it with intention for the first time. But done properly and structured, it's, it's the most powerful thing you'll do to actually take control of your life in a way where you can make millions of dollars and have a better body, all these things. But here's how it starts. The first thing is, is understand that you have holes in your bucket that you don't know where the placement is. And, and if you continue doing what you're doing to patch up holes that don't exist, right, because you're doing things other people told you to do. You'll never actually patch the holes that are in your bucket, in your placement positions. And so maybe you're putting a, a patch on the left side because Bob did, but yours on the right side. Do whatever you want. Learn, read. Do it. You're still pouring stuff out of that side because you don't communicate well. You bottle your stuff up. You're, you know, whatever it might be. Bad with money. You name it. The first stage of this process of three is the C stage. And the C stage is the hardest stage because if you can't see what your identity is now, you will never know what to work on to shift it. You'll spend years of your life, maybe the rest of your life, doing the wrong work and getting burned out doing it, never having success, or spend a quarter of the energy in the right direction and skyrocket your success. So the way you do that is you have to find ways to be able to genuinely see who you are. And this is where it gets tricky, because a lot of us are completely blind to the things that are really going on in our lives. We don't see the label on the jar. However, other people do. So one of the things that we do is we, we have a process where we actually allow people to dive in that are close to you and tell you things that you do not want to hear, but you need to hear and finally give them permission to give you insights that typically your ego might not accept and you might cut them off. But if you open yourself up to that, it's hard at first, but then you finally get this perspective to see who you are. And, and if you can let the ego down, which I call everyone's greatest obstacle, EGO, when you let it down, you'll finally give yourself permission to improve in the areas you need to. That is the first piece of it all. And if I give you nothing more, that will open up the door for so much more in your life. Because if you just simply can see yourself for the first time and go, oof, that's really who I am and own it, accept it, and then give yourself permission to improve upon that, it'll change your life. Because then you'll know what you should be working on, not just work on the stuff that's fun or safe or doesn't hurt your heart to acknowledge. Yeah. And that's kind of what we've been talking about the whole time. Sometimes you got to put in the dark work. Like you said, I, Oh man, that's it. I think for the rest of my life, Anthony, I'm going to think about that, that young Anthony truck sitting on his back, throwing that bottle. How many times was it? 500 a day, man. I got good. It took Dude, a couple I'm, hours. I'm never not going to think about that. And you know, they, there's books out there talking about like the amount of hours you got to put into something until you perfect it, you know, whether it's Gates or anybody else, they've all done it. Well, that's what you did. Yeah. And you continue to do that. You continue to move the needle today. So if people want to learn step two and three and four, what would be the next steps where they can get around your circle and start learning how to change their lives and transform? 
Man, best days, grab the book. It's a great, uh, it's a great start. And then follow me on social. I mean, the thing is, is it's a journey that not everybody's supposed to be taking right now. It may be something you take and you, you file away into like the when life gets crazy kind of moment. <laughs> uh, or it's something you go, you know what, I want to proactively pursue another level. It's kind of that thing where you don't know what you don't know. If you don't know, you don't know it, right? There's, there's a lever that somebody doesn't realize is sitting in the background. They can pull and they can have their life change on a dime by the end of the year, right? But you have not even been privy to the information of how to do it. So the book's a great way for you to finally like open your eyes and go, oh, crap, that's what's been going on. And then it changes the way you see everything, right? And then when you can make that perspective shift, then you start making different choices, decisions, different habits, and you lead yourself down this path of this curiosity, which I think is a big precursor to passion, which then leads to obsession. And the obsession leads you to doing that dark work. And you look at your life a year from now and go, I don't even remember who I was back last year. Man, that's good stuff. Love it. Anthony, it's been a real pleasure kind of go through the story to learn more about like the man and how you became where you're at now. So folks grab that book, follow them on all social media. How did they, what's your uh, handle on? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, the the book's called identity shift upgrade, how you operate to elevate your life and Amazon identity shift. And then uh, my socials it's Anthony trucks. It's very simple name T R U C K S. But if you go to Instagram at Anthony trucks, YouTube, all those kind of things. I have a son who has the same name. So if you see a guy that looks like he's, you know, 17, that's definitely not me. <laughs> It'd be fun to watch that journey as well. Cause uh, will. you know, under looks your like. guidance and following the path and the leadership, that'll be interesting. So I appreciate everything. Have a safe trip out to, uh, I believe you're going to California for an event to so speak. I'm, and, in, uh, I'm in California now, but I'm heading down to set South, you know, SoCal, San Diego. <laughs> San Diego. Diego. Nice. Yeah. Well, have a good trip down there and, and Thank crush you. it. Thanks so much. Yeah. Welcome. Bye. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you wanna know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.